Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Finally, I understand why the New York I grew up in is so different from the one I live in now. Joshua Friedman's book, Working Class New York, Life and Labor Since World War II, explains it all with clarity and passion. Did I say life? Is that right? Yes, it is life. It is. It's life. You got it right. You know, you talk about the working class, and that's a term right. that we don't really use now. Let's well, talk yeah. about it. Well, it's true, and I think, you know, uh, many academics have uh, interesting debates about exactly who fits there, but I use it in a very common sense way. I mean, to describe people who basically survived off of their daily labor, they were wage workers who did not have a lot of control over the circumstances of their uh, working lives, and, and, and so uh, I, I think this was uh, a common term and a common idea uh, not so long ago. Why has it disappeared? Well, that's a tough question. I mean, I think uh, some of it is a, a general sense in the United States since World War II to uh, see everybody as middle class. And, and some of this has a, to do with a kind of democracy of consumption. We could all afford at least superficially similar things. Right. We all go to Target or someplace like that. Right. So that, uh, but, you can once tell working class people by their teeth, by their clothes, you, you can't do that quite the same way anymore. But you talk, it's, a, it's almost romantically mm. at the beginning of the book, about what life was like in the 50s as far as the working class yeah. or as far as New York City goes, the excitement on the street mm. and all of that. And just tell us a little bit about the difference. Well, I think what, what many, that is. Yeah, sure. I think what a lot of people don't realize is that New York was a blue collar town um, yeah. a generation or two ago. In fact, it was by far the largest manufacturing center in the United States. So, you know, we tend to think about Detroit or, right. or Chicago or Cleveland, but it was New York. And, and you could see it. You could see it everywhere. You could see it particularly actually in Lower Manhattan, which is just full of machine shops and garment shops and printing shops. And, and, and if you looked out at the rivers, it would be completely full of tugs and, and barges. And, and so this kind of physical activity it was a pervasive presence in the city, and I think it had a culture associated with it, which was New York City culture. And there, was there more, pro I mean, New York City still has a lot of working class people. They're all in the, in the service industries and mm. in the, I mean, working on computers and stuff like mm. that, even though we've lost the manufacturing. So they're basically still working class, but there isn't that pride in being working class, is there? Have our goals changed? Yes, yeah, somewhat. Now, I, I don't want to be over romantic. Yeah. I think, you know. I am. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, well, it varied. You know, I don't think garment workers wanted their kids to be garment workers. Yeah. You know, but right. construction workers wanted their kids to be construction workers, and printers wanted their kids to be printers. So, I think uh, there was much less acceptance a couple generations ago that upward mobility was all such a great thing. You know, and in fact, yeah. there was a kind of moral disdain for the rich that's pretty rare now. You know, who's seen as kind of parasitic, right. uh, morally inferior to hardworking, solid folk. The manufacturing in New York was different from the manufacturing outside of New York City. Absolutely. We were so that was a major difference. Yeah, we, were, we didn't have the gigantic factories with 10,000 people. We had small shops uh, that were known for their innovation, for the, the, their speed in which they could turn around, the variety of products. Uh, garment industry would be the, the most important, but there were many others too. One of the other things that I found fascinating, because I, I grew up in, on the west side of Manhattan, my family was very interested in the community, and we just grew up with, mm. that's what you're supposed to be interested in. And I went to the High School of Music and Art, which was really a hotbed of, you know, progressive whatever. So you talked about the influence of, of the communists mm. in, in the labor movement, mm. and then the backlash against communism and trying the, all the red baiting that went on and that that had a, a sizable impact on what happened. Yeah, I, th I think it did. Yeah, New York was a real battleground during the McCarthy era because we had a very big left, you know, communists and other types too, and they were very strong in, in, in the labor movement and they got there because they contributed. Uh, but we also had a big anti-communist uh, movement here. We had newspaper columnists, we had uh, uh, parts of the Catholic Church, we had politicians, so, and, and people within the labor movement. You know, so this was really fought out. And I think what happened was, even though some of the ideas and approaches of, of the left remained prevalent in the labor movement, people no longer could speak of themselves as uh, radicals in the same way mm -hmm. as socialists or communists. They had to use a kind of uh, sub rosa language, which, which I think actually in the long run undercut their influence because they, they seemed very bland. You didn't realize how right. amazing a lot of their achievements actually were because they used this 
kind of depoliticized language, and you still see that today, I think. Do you think, but also in addition to the communists, it was the Roosevelt years, the WPA, the, with the work projects and the different theater groups and the different things that came out of the WPA that didn't have, that had a strong influence too, right? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. you had this kind of a coalition, both in, in politics and in culture, you know, that went from the, the left all the way through a kind of liberal coalition, and, and it was for many years, the kind of dominant force in, in New York life, in the LaGuardia years, I think right. in, in a different way, even into the Wagner years. And you talk about Mark Antonio as being so important in the city as far as what he did. Sure, you know, he's, it, there's those wonderful paintings by Ralph, Ralph Fascinella, uh, yes, you know, of, of his funeral that <laughs> capture, I think, the way he was this just a mesmerizing figure who transcended uh, his own political tendency, which is very much of the left, particularly among Italians and, and, and Puerto Ricans in, in you know, East uh, Harlem, in East Harlem. And, and uh, you know, there were these kinds of uh, popular tribunes, I call them, people like Mike Quill, Mark Antonio, Adam Clayton Powell, who were of the left, but they were much broader than that. You know, uh, they were kind they of... They came with a big social agenda, right? Exactly. Exa and they were and a deep philosophy about what life should be like. That's right. And then, of course, they had personal you know, charisma yeah. associated with themselves. And, and so they could be the voice for the kind of general population. That was an extraordinarily talented group of people. Mike Quill, I remember when he came to Columbia, because I went to Barnard to organize the service employees at Columbia. It was very exciting for everybody to go and listen to this fiery guy. Um, he was really, he also said, my husband always talks about him, and he quotes something because he said he led the campaign for a four-day week, I think. Mm -hmm. And you talk about yeah. that, a four-day week. And then they they went out on strike, and then they came back, and they had a settlement, and there was no four-day week. <laughs> and one of the reporters said, what happened to the four-day week? And Mike Quill said, changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> and if only we could get more people to say, changed my mind, and then, you know, admit right, that they made right, a mistake, right. it would be great today. <laughs> so that's one of the of one of the major milestones you cite in the development of the labor working class mm -hmm. or labor mm -hmm. movement in New York, right? Then we come, so it was in the 50s, and it was after the Second World War mm -hmm. and all of that. Then... What happened? Well, lots of things happened. One was economic change, you know, in the country and in the city, which was the, the weakening of the manufacturing sector, you know, and, and, and that had to do with a lot of things. By the way, some of it was directly response to how strong the labor movement here was. I mean, a lot of companies that thought, I don't want to deal with these people, and they, they relocated. Some of it was, was price competition. Some of it was space competition. You know, it was hard to build modern factories in New York. Right. Uh, and there's definitely an, an interesting story in, in the level of planning and zoning where I think the uh, developers who were moving towards office development, white collar uh, type of, of development for the city uh, had more clout and played it, played it much better. And so um, we saw a big decline you know, over the years in, in, in manufacturing, which changed the character of the working class. I mean, it didn't eliminate it. I mean, uh, there were data entry clerks at Citibank you know, yeah. and, uh, who were getting jobs and so forth. But that was certainly a big change. Um, and then, as you said, the success of the labor unions, I guess, and especially then the development of the municipal unions yeah. in the city. Yeah. And then, so what, what happened was the next thing, the loss of the manufacturing thing, then what did we do? We went to... Well, before, I would say parallel to that, and this happened all over the country, is suburbanization, which meant that a lot of uh, working class folks moved out of their old neighborhoods, either, you know, to the suburbs or, or the outer parts of the city. You know, you think of areas like uh, where now Starrett City is, for example, or, or the Northern Bronx. So I think some of that cohesion, that kind of cultural cohesion, when you lived in the same neighborhood uh, with people that you work with, that you went to church with, that you had gone to school with, uh, that sort of dissipated. And I think the, the, that kind of sense of being part of a working class became weaker as people no longer uh, live necessarily in those kinds of homogeneous neighborhoods. So I think that was happening uh, at the same time. Um, and, you know, this was a company with big population fluxes, a big influx of uh, Southern African Americans and Puerto Ricans, mm -hmm. um, who uh, in some cases were not greeted with open arms by the labor movement, which I think uh, weakened the labor movement. I mean, there's a very mixed record here, some wonderful things and some not so wonderful things. But it meant that the next generation did not necessarily always see organized labor as their protectors. And, you know, if, if you were a, a, a black man coming to New York from the South and in, in 1916 wanted to work in the construction trades, you would not see organized labor as your friend. Because, I don't think you know, that it was, they were that friendly in the 80s. It, well, <laughs> that's, that's true I enough. remember touring yeah. at, at New York, at NYU Hospital when they were building one of the new hospitals and being shown the graffiti. Yeah. And, you know, while the frame of the building was up and nothing more, it was really terrible. It was not only anti 
it was racially mm. terrible and it was also sexist. It was really a bad thing. Yeah, sure. But so, but New York never was exactly the same as the rest of the country. And I mean, in, in a way, it explained to me the tradition I, that I grew up with. That's all very personal. Mm. Uh, then when I got elected or when I worked in a national political campaign or something, they'd say, oh, she's from New York, you know, <laughs> right, right. from New York. It's right. always different. Right. It has that different reputation. Right. Why was that? Well, I think it's a lot of things. I mean, uh, uh, New York did not lose population to the suburbs to the same extent. There's a kind of cultural commitment to an urbanism here that I don't think you see in many other places. Some of it has to do with the physical structures of, of the city. We're a city of renters and not of uh, right. homeowners, which means that whole kind of property tax politics, which I think tended to be quite conservative, in my view, very anti-government, you know, Prop yeah, 13, right. didn't, didn't play out here to the same extent. Um, I think there was that sort of sense of... Uh, Instead, we had rent control. We had rent control, which was this endless mobilization to defend, and, and, and I think it, it helped maintain some of these identities and, and, and right. political structures. Um, so, th so the physical makeup of the city, I think, was very different. I think for all the tensions, uh, New York City remained and, and still remains a relatively liberal place on race relations and inter-ethnic relations. These are valued. So even though you have discrimination and fighting, there's also a certain embrace of this, which I think was, was uncharacteristic. And we continue to embrace a model which looked to government or collective solutions to individual problems. So the most of the country is going on this you know, uh, path that says, let's go into kind of racially exclusive suburbs and pay as few taxes as possible, even if it means having very few services, and we don't need that stuff because I'll join the private gym and send my kid to private school. You know, New York basically did, went a different route, you know, where we, we continue to believe in collective solutions, whether through government or through unions or through nonprofits like HIP or mm. GHI to health care, to education, to uh, all the kinds of everyday problems uh, that we have. And I think this increasingly was at odds with the dominant political culture. So when you get to the 1970s, when New York is in big financial trouble, a lot of Congress thinks, you know, they deserve it, and um, I'm glad they're going where they deserve, straight down to hell, you know. It, it, when we, let's backtrack a little bit. When we said that the manufacturing was different, that mm -hmm. also in the city than outside was smaller unions and things, and that meant that they were dealing, you point out, with smaller businesses. And so the unions then became the providers of the services that we're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, w many of the employers in New York really couldn't have organized, even if they wanted mm -hmm. to health plans or, 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 or pension plans or even uh, uh, just organized distribution of work in seasonal industries. Um, and the unions, like the garment unions and, and, and the printing unions, were often big, you know, much more powerful than any individual shop. It's true in construction, too, right. to a large extent. So they took upon themselves, in a sense, the, the responsibility to organize uh, uh, these kinds of benefits and, and sometimes apprenticeship programs and ultimately taking on even more ambitious things like co-op housing. They often did it in cooperation with the employer, but the employers are usually playing second fiddle uh, uh, to the union. So these unions really conceive of themselves in a much more broad and inventive way, I think, than unions that dealing with a single employer and, and an employer like, I'd say, a GM, which they're just not going to concede control over something like health insurance. You know, they may bargain because they're forced to legally, mm. but they're not going to concede control. So these were very unusual institutions in New York, I think. Did the municipal unions in New York get more? Were they, did, were they able to get higher wages than comparable in other cities in the, in the country? To some extent. I think where they really did better was in benefits. Mm. And in fact, you know, at pretty much throughout the history, when you look closely, the wages for a lot of municipal workers were never that good, and they're not that good today. Um, I think what the unions were able to win was security and, and these benefit packages. The pensions. And exactly. The, yeah. And I think they modeled themselves on the garment unions, oh. which had done the same thing. It was not a high-paid industry, but there were a lot of good protections and benefits. So the municipal unions both bargained with the city for a lot of these things, and they provided a lot of these things themselves. I mean, if even today, and this was true 20 years ago too, you go to a union like DC 37 and you open their newspaper, and they've got a free legal service, they've got an optical clinic, a dental clinic, they've got you know classes uh, in English for non-native yeah. speakers, and college courses, and things for members' kids, and summer camps. Uh, it's a whole life, you know. The wages are still no good if you're a clerk for the city in New York, but but you have a, a, a decent life because of all these other things so that come with it. The next crisis then, I mean, after we shifted out yeah. and 
unions, yeah. as you said, lost some of their verve or something, yeah. came the fiscal crisis right. in the city. Right. And that was, is that where it emerged? I mean, the really, that became so obvious, the shift in power. Yeah, I, I think it's the turning point. I think it's the turning point in my book, but I think it's the turning point in modern New York, and in some ways, uh, way beyond New York. Um, yeah, that New York was hard hit. Some of this is a national recession that hits New York particularly hard. But these other things also had long-term impact. The tax base was really no longer corresponding to the kinds of services the city was providing. Part of it was an influx of poor people from mm -hmm. elsewhere in the country. Uh, and New York City, unlike most places, had to contribute a great deal to the cost of the federally welfare program. Right, we we have, up, you know, back quarter of the cost. I remember the figure was something like $600 or $900 a year. I mean, some grotesque yeah. figure in Mississippi as compared to 4000 or 5000 This was in the 70s. That's right. Yeah. And, and, and in most towns and cities across the country, the state and the federal government picked right. up the whole cost. Right. I think New York City paid about a quarter of it. Right. So the budget costs were going way, way up. The tax base was eroding with suburbanization and loss of, of, of industry. This big recession comes. Uh, the city had been dealing with the growing gap between income and expenditures uh, by simply borrowing lots of money and rolling it over and rolling it over and rolling it over uh, from banks that had been happy to lend the money uh, because they were making money on it till the recession hit. And suddenly the banks thought, this does not look like a good risk anymore, and essentially said, you know, give us our money back. And this became the occasion for a kind of political offensive uh, by both those very banks who had been pretty inattentive to city social and political mm -hmm. problems till then. And suddenly they got very interested in them. They got a little scared they might not get their money back, but they also saw this as an occasion to really set a model for a different kind of economic and political structure. And they picked New York, uh, I think opportunistically, the crisis was there. They didn't, in a sense, really create it, but they, they picked it with people like William Simon, for, and it, it was in the Ford. It was the Secretary yeah, of the Treasury. Treasury in the, in the Ford. And a very conservative person. Very conservative person. Had been a bonds guy, had, in fact, helped build up this debt by selling bonds for the yes. city, you know, for, for his private uh, enterprise before he went to government. Right. So the, I think you, you saw a sudden and, and really very rapid coalescing of, of financial interests and, and political forces, conservative political forces, that said, you know, what's this deal with rent control and it was, free college and, you know, garbage men retiring at age 55? You know, right. this is crazy. Let's, let's get rid of it. So this was the emergence of what we now call the fire industries. I think it, is that, was that when it first came? Financial, insurance, real estate? Well, they had been building up uh, over the years and becoming increasingly important. I mean, if you just look at, at, at Lower Manhattan, you see that whole yeah. ring of buildings built in the 60s, you know, like the city corp right. headquarters and so forth, which was a kind of physical manifestation of their growing importance. But both as employers and political forces, this is the moment they really come into their own and, and, and identify with a conservative agenda. You know, and again, it, it's linked into Congress and it's linked into, into Washington. And they, this, I think you can make the case this is really the turning point towards what sometimes people today call neoliberalism, which is not liberalism at all, but a kind of free market conservatism that, that said, you know, the, the cost of these kinds of benefits uh, and, and protections, particularly for working class people, were a kind of drain on the American economy. You got to get rid of it all, you know, and, and uh, uh, let the free market, you know, d do its work. And, and in fact, some of these people wanted the city to go into bankruptcy because bankruptcy was a way of just clearing, clearing the decks. Yeah. What was the role of the unions? I mean, they played some very interesting roles. Right. There. Well, they were absolutely central. I mean, in the beginning, they were very much on the defensive. They, they realized very quickly there were going to be big layoffs and big attacks on their benefits. And at first, they simply tried to kind of uh, hang on to as much as they could. But pretty quickly, they realized that this was going to be impossible, that the, 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 the confluence of forces they faced you know, which is the federal government and the largest capitalist institutions in the world. <laughs> you know, not good. Yeah, it was not good. So I think they first decided to do a kind of measured retreat and actually reopened contracts and agreed to deferring, agreed to wage increases and giving up certain things. Uh, for example, uh, it was a big tradition in New York that people who work for government work w one hour less in the summer. Going back to the pre-air conditioning days, you know, it was called summer hours. It was so darn right. hot, you know, yeah. people, and, and, and they, you know, they gave that up because this was the kind of example that critics right. were saying, oh, you know, why is, why do you still have this? Um, but then they went beyond that because uh, as it really was unclear if New York City would be able to survive without some sort of bankruptcy, they realized that they were sitting on a huge 
pot of money, which were the, the city pension funds, which right. you know were controlled by boards in which the unions had a lot of influence. And they, in effect, agreed to bail out the city. I mean, they, in effect, paid back the, they lent a lot of money to the city by buying new bonds, and then the city used that money to pay back the old bondholders. In other words, people who had held paper from New York, which included a lot of banks and wealthy people. Well, themselves. Yeah, and themselves. So the exactly. irony of it, I mean, they right. took labor's money. Right. Right. To fill their coffers. Right, that's right. So they got rid of their risk, or, right. or much of it. And of course, eventually, the, the, the federal government got involved, too, with seasonal loans, short-term loans, to help uh, over the course of the tax year, because fluctuations right. in income. So this is a lot of money. This is, this is billions of dollars of uh, workers' savings, in a sense. They, you know, their yeah. future is a big gamble. Uh, uh, a number of years ago, I was talking to Jack Beagle, who was the yeah. consultant to the unions, who kind of masterminded this deal. And, and you know, he said, in retrospect, I can't believe we, we you know, rolled the dice with these people's money. Uh, but uh, in the end, it, I think they, they, they really had a pretty modest agenda. They wanted to maintain collective bargaining. You know, uh, they were fearful that there would be a bankruptcy or some other procedure which would essentially eliminate collective bargaining for, you know, government employees. And they wanted to try to minimize layoffs anyway. Um, and that was really all they asked for in return, and that's all they got. They didn't get really much more than that. And it kind of seated at the table. Well, I think that seat was pretty nominal. I mean, frankly, I don't think they really were calling the shots, but at least they were. Did they get their they, money back at all? They did, actually. All right. In fact, they, you know, <laughs> as they were all very careful to tell you, they, they did uh, get their money back. It was so risky that they actually had to change both state and federal law because it would have been illegal. You know, it would have violated right. fiduciary responsibility. Uh, of the trustees to do this. They actually changed the law. But in the end, actually, they got all the money so back. Did any heroes arise from this for the working class? No. <laughs> not really. Not political heroes, not union heroes. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Uh, sometimes you write a book and you, you pretty much know what you're going to say. I, this was an area I think I, I, I changed my view a little bit. I'd been quite critical of the union leaders for, it seemed to me, uh, giving up a lot and not getting much in return. But I think as I, 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 as I worked on this book, I became increasingly impressed on how uh, sober the situation right. they were in. And I think that they acted, in the end, prudently, but not heroically. Um, so I think that really there, there, there weren't uh, heroes, it, it, you know, um, except in a sense the tenacity that a lot of workers and a lot of unions had, that they stuck it out. And then by the 80s, they did begin to kind of rebuild some. Yeah, so some things were not lost. For example, rent control, which was very much in the target of right. uh, Washington. We did keep. You know, for a while. For a while. But I, in, I mean, that's what is so distressing, because you look at the world today, where uh, w what's valued is money. Right. Right. You know, the glitz, as you right. talk about, that we're now a global city. So right. in a way, what turns, what gets people excited right. is is the glitz of the right. city right. and Trump and the buildings right. and right. The, the big stuff and everything. Right. So what, and, but there are many people here who are essentially working class. For sure. So what's happened? Why aren't they? And you pay tuition at the city university, right? right. right? The classes in school are still yeah. too crowded. Yeah. We don't, I mean, there are lots of benefits yeah. that are not. And then you go out on strike, such as um, the TWU did, and what happens? Right. Well, that's a darn tough question to ask, and I'm not sure I can answer all of it. I mean, some of it's a cultural change in the United States. I mean, a guy like Trump, I think, would have seen it, would have been seen as crude and provincial in, well, in the I 60s. Still see him as yeah, that. And, and, <laughs> and, and or even, for example, architecturally. I remember right. when they started opening these Marriott hotels with, you know, huge atriums, just like kind of Atlanta-style architecture right. comes to New York and being hailed as the savior of the city. So, so the city lost something in the 70s beyond just its, its economic status. Um, and I think that cult of, of, of money has been very destructive. I think it's not only the city, it's most likely the world. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You're a professor of history. Yeah. I mean, we haven't even talked about yeah. that. How did you get into interested in labor? Well, I think uh, when I was in grad school, I was thinking about the world I grew up. I was born in 1949, and you know, I'm in school, I'm reading about the New Deal in the 30s, and uh, it seems such an incredibly dynamic and, and, and sort of uh, era full of potential. At the time when I started becoming conscious of politics, and you know, even yeah. as a kid, that seemed gone. I, I think I first got into this thing: what happened to that world? Well, you so know? you have an important role because you try to teach yeah. students that. I yeah. mean, I think it's a dawned on me that a lot of people don't know the world could be different. Right. They right. don't know people could act differently right. than the way they do. Right. How do we 
how right. do we change that? Right. No, it's a good, it's a good if it's point. If it's going to get further diluted and diluted, we're going to be in a terrible society. I think it's already uh, changed. You know, one colleague of mine who read the book, you know, made an interesting point. Said, you know, new immigrants who come to New York n never have a notion that the government could do all these right. things because they've never actually experienced it. So. Um, they all turn to that. They turn yeah. to other things, whether it's church or, or, or community Family, or ethnic or, yeah. or individualism. Yeah. One of the, you know, because, so I think, you know, I guess that is a role of historians. And an important change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Very big change. And, and I think it's, it's something that, you know, historians can, in a sense, uh, uh, bring back the past the best we can. And, and I think to show that change happened in the past, which means, in a sense, change can happen in the future too, that, that things aren't always the same, that, 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 you know, I think especially for young people, you know what you know and that's it. And, and I think what historians can do, just like travel can do, is to show the whole range of different ways of organizing, you know, right. human existence. And, and people, to some extent anyway, get to choose, you know, which direction to go. So, you know, in a modest way, I think that's what us, you know. So you have a very story. important mission. <laughs> well, the important mission, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> where, uh, where do you teach classes? Uh, I normally teach at, at Queens College and here at the Graduate Center. At the moment, I'm chairing the history department here at the Grad Center, so I'm, I'm, I'm primarily here. But uh, usually, I teach both undergraduate and graduate students. So um, it's a professor then, Professor I'm Freeman. Professor, we yeah. look forward to you. We look to you for leadership of this world, mm -hmm. and uh, I appreciate this book very much. And I hope that people will read it because it's a very interesting and a great explanation of why we are where we are today. Well, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank Thanks you. for having me. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016. Or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.